So I welcome our friends online. I remind you to ask your questions by sending an email message to questions at francisvisil.com. Thank you. Yeah. Start again, I can So say hi to your friends online. <laughs> I guess we won't do that every time, so. <laughs> <laughs> now you, you know who's here, so. Any questions here? Uh, Francis, this afternoon, you, during the meditation session, you mentioned effortless effort. I'm not sure I understood that totally. Did I say that? Yes, you did. <laughs> effortless effort, and I wasn't clear what that meant. Well, effortless effort is an effort that you, to which you, you 100% agree. It's like when I play tennis, it's an effort for the body, but it's enjoyment for me, you see. So an effortless effort is an effort which is not an effort for you because you agree to do it completely. You see what I mean? If, 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 if I have to, to take out the trash, then that's more effort. <laughs> it's not like playing tennis. Although playing tennis is more exhausting for the body. just as we were starting to do the movement. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, yeah you, so you were mentioning it, uh, you know, very close to when we were starting to do the movement, with like turning clockwise and anti-clockwise. So, is, so effortless effort would be, it's, it's an effort for the body, but it's, but no, in it's the space there's no effort? In that case, it's not an effort for the body. I don't remember the context in which I, I said that. Should have been self-explanatory then, I, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Does anybody remember? It will clarify itself next time. Yes, Peter. I'm sorry, it's going to sound a little bit confused, but um, uh, my sadhana up until recently, or no, still continuing, has been very much based on uh, the redirection of attention in the form of self-sensing, self-observation, trying to follow self-sensing, self-observation, trying to follow uh, the guidelines from Maharishi's works and teachings, who am I, go to follow that to the source. Uh, I have to say now that I'm having grave doubts about that um, approach because it seems to me that it's still contained within a certain matrix within, um, within uh, this field of experiencing my normal field of experiencing. And 
I started to feel that I'm in a dead end and don't realize it. And I started, and this was reinforced recently by an unusual event during meditation where there was a sense of, a, of an opening above and beyond my normal field of awareness. And it gave me a glimpse that there was a, a world above and beyond this normal field of, of awareness. And I thought, and that's just reinforced my doubts that this directing of attention is, well, I don't know what more to say about that. I think I'll stop at that point. You, we don't want to get rid of the baby as we get rid of the bath water. Uh, the teaching of Ramana is not that which is found in a book. He himself said it. The teaching was his presence. That was the essence of the teaching. Then we cannot complain following or following through our own effort. So what is said in the book in contradiction with the teaching of Ramana himself. Uh, and not reaching the goal, we cannot from that reach the conclusion that the teaching was wrong. The only one who can say that were the one who have been his disciples, not the one who have read his books. You following me? Because he said the teaching is in this silent transmission. All the rest is kind of the asking of the, on the cake. All the rest is subjected to dependent on this direct transmission. He used to say that the highest form of teaching was Dakshinamurti's teaching, who taught only in silence, without words. And the silence he's talking about is not the absence of words, nor is it the absence of thoughts. It is that which is beyond the thoughts and the sounds. So, the most important condition in a teaching is the teacher. I know that there are many Neo-Advaita forms of teaching that are based on the kind of knowledge you derive from books. And uh, usually what you will find in these teachings first is that they are silent precisely on the silent transmission. They don't speak about it because they don't have this experience. And the second element that you often find, we, that we often find, is that the teaching is not about happiness, but, it, but it's more about understanding, you know, this grand scheme of things. And then, whereas in the traditional teachings, it's really about happiness. It's really about getting established in happiness, which, is, which has two aspects. It has a st static aspect, which is peace, and it has a dynamic aspect, which, which is joy. Uh, the, the investigative method is in fact only a preparation, that's the part the student has to do. 
uh, it is like cleaning the house and making it beautiful to honor the guest who is going to pay you a visit. But it is not the visit of the king. That which really matters is the visit of the king. Nevertheless, the king won't come in most cases unless you invite him through this preparation. And this preparation is really the deconstruction of the belief systems we have inherited and also of the feeling systems we have inherited about the nature of self. If we believe, which is only natural in our Western culture, that we can reach the goal through reading the books and through discursive thinking. Of course, we are going to be disappointed because thought cannot transcend itself. Thought can only remain within the realm of thought. And that which we seek is not within the realm, the, the realm of thought. Even the cessation of thought is still within the realm of thought, within mind. That which we seek is beyond the presence and the absence of thought. It is the, the background of this presence and of this absence. It is that which is really alive, that which truly perceives. The, the investigative approach, this deconstruction, takes place on two levels. On the intellectual level, if you will, or on the concept, on the level of concepts. The goal is to liberate ourselves from all the superimposed beliefs we have inherited from our parents, society, uh, pertaining to the nature of consciousness. We believe consciousness to be a byproduct of the brain, of the mind, of the body, whatever and uh, to be an object dependent upon other objects, to be limited in time, to be limited, to be local, localized in space. And these belief systems have to be investigated. How? Not really intellectually by reading books on uh, neuroscience or whatever, but experientially, based on our own experience of consciousness, because we are always in the lab, so to speak, as far as consciousness is concerned. So we can always ask questions from, just as in science we ask questions from nature by conducting experiment, experiments, here we can always ask questions from consciousness. Questions such as consciousness, are you limited? Consciousness, were you born? And see what consciousness says. And it turns out that consciousness says nothing. <laughs> so then, Occam's razor dictates that if consciousness says nothing, we don't believe anything about it. 
especially not that it was born. You see what I mean? Neither that it wasn't. We have to, uh, uh, intelligence, reason, uh, uh, compel us to be agnostic on this point. And there is a marked difference between being a believer uh, of the religion of limited consciousness and being agnostic on, the, on this, you see. The second realm of investigation is the realm of perception and bodily sensations because we somehow believe that even if there is no evidence to be found on the intellectual level, on the conceptual level, there is still a strong body of evidence in the body, in our experience of the body. Our body, our experience of the body seems to be screaming, I am you. You see? And that has to be debunked. And the way to debunk, to debunk it is through the contemplation of the body. So that's the part we do here during the yoga. Of course, we use some, some uh, clever means, if you will, but to do that, but basically that's what it boils down to. The, the, the mere contemplation of the body will eventually uh, force upon us the conclusion that there is no evidence either at that level that consciousness is limited in any shape or form. So that's a preparatory work that we have to do. And uh, then once that is done, something else will reveal itself. It may have begun to reveal itself, you know, the experience you alluded to has a perfume of um, infinity to it. But no, whatever ex spiritual experience we we are the witness of. That which is important, that which is prime of all in this experience, is always that which is invisible. That which is non-phenomenal. That which has no shape, no duration. That which is always true. The part of a spiritual experience that came and went shouldn't attract our interest because it's phenomenal, it's objective. But that doesn't mean that the <coughs> Numinal, the subjective experience, the experience of our true nature, is devoid of qualities, you see. It simply means that it is devoid of phenomenal qualities, such as size, color, duration, shape, structure. But it doesn't mean it is devoid of non-phenomenal qualities. It, in other words, it doesn't mean the experience of our true nature is some kind of a blank wall without any savor or flavor or, 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 or perfume. Because on the quite, it is quite the opposite. It has the perfume of love, the perfume of beauty, the perfume of happiness, the perfume of humor, the perfume of eternity, 
All these perfumes I've just listed are non-phenomenal. They may attach to phenomena in the same way as the perfume of the flower attaches to the flower. But the perfume is independent from the flower in that sense that it is non non-local. It is not limited to and by the flower. So the, the hallmark of, of a spiritual experience is precisely that it is non-phenomenal, but not bland, that it fulfills forever our longing, our sense of incompletude or incompletion, our sense of being incomplete, our sense of lack. When it comes to us, we know it, just as we recognize happiness, or we recognize love, or we recognize intelligence or humor, when we see them. We don't need someone to tell us, you see, that's beautiful, or that's loving. We don't care about these superimposed labels on an experience. It is self-explanatory, self-evident. See, it's just that we have to grow antennas somehow to resonate with these non-phenomenal qualities. They are the the names of God of the Sufi tradition. Oh, a thousand names of God, or I don't remember how many, but many. And that's that which we don't find in a book. And it is these perfumes that hopefully coming here in our togetherness we'll have a, an inkling of, or a sample of, you see, so that hopefully coming here, we can experience a little moment of paradise, a little island of paradise, you see, in our, in our the way we interrelate to each other, so that the teaching here is not really only the dialogues, uh, like right now, or the meditation session. The teaching is in the air, in the birds, in the sun, in the people, in the food. You see? We just have to, to let it come to us in our openness. Another way to put it is this. The first part of the job is achieved to a large extent through reason. But the second part is achieved more through poetry. You see, there are words that logically convince us or rationally convince us, and these words purify us from belief systems that have no foundation in facts. But then, to be taken beyond the threshold, we need something that comes from beyond the threshold. We need an angel who comes and takes us by the hand helps us crossing. That's grace, that's something we cannot foresee. But, um, you know, if we build a field, they will come. (laughs) 
You don't have that in Australia, huh? Baseball. Yeah, you do. 